the ghost entered my dreams again last night. I dreamt I'd risen from my bed to wind up the old clock in the parlour. After setting the pendulum swinging, I glanced at the hour, and a ghastly human face seemed for a moment superimposed upon the brass face of the clock. Silently mouthing some unfathomable words. It was the same ghost that has haunted me these past 23 years. It was Marlowe's ghost. Christopher Marlowe. Or Kit to his friends. When I first arrived in London, he was the toast of the town. Back then it was enough just to walk in the shadow he cast. 1590. Well, a fledgling actor, or so I thought myself. Nothing but an old leather bag across my back and a handful of poor scribblings in my pocket. I sought and soon discovered employment with the Admiral's men of the Shoreditch Playhouse. Well, I was mostly bored treading for the smaller roles at the time. You see, one has to inveigle oneself into the kinship of these playmen by degrees. Well, the world of the theatre is a very close-knit community. But... It acquainted me with several men who were, at the time, of great influence. One of them being Edward Allen, the actor. Or Ned, as he was to us. <laughs> Born and weaned amongst the playhouse crowd. Well, Born for such parts as Kitts, um, Tamburlaine, Faustus, Tom Kitts, Hieronimo and my own Mercutio. He played them all. They mostly for Kit's company, but later for the troupe that I eventually joined, the Lord Chamberlain's men. But in 1590, I was one of Philip Henslow's lackeys you know, for the Admiral's troop. Back then, we'd often repair to the Unicorn and Bishopsgate sitting between a harlot's den and a bear pit. It had a certain colour and life about it, a wild, coarse reputation. <laughs> it was there that Ned Allen first introduced me to Kit. On the very night that Henslow decided to give Thomas Kidd's The Spanish Tragedy another run. And Ned was to don Geronimo's garb once more. Quarter of a century ago. Seems like the blink of an eye. How would I describe Kit Marlowe? Small, thin, intense, and uh, undeniably attractive. He had the whole world at his feet. That his swagger couldn't conceal a, a certain air of vulnerability. You see, he and Tom Kidd shared lodgings in Bishopsgate, just two streets away from my own squalid den. Well, Tom Kidd was a, a dour, waspish fellow. Well, too old for his years, with the gloomy aspect of a clerical scholar. But these two were the men to know if I wished to learn the playwright's profession. See, I'd been hankering to meet Kit for, for two weeks, ever since I saw Tamblaine. I mean, it was a complete escape from the old plays, from all their formy leg lines, all that posturing. Kit escaped the old need to 
slavishly rhyme each line with the next, but still retained rhythm and balance. And there was a certain beat that I thought clever. Five drum beats to each sentence. Dum de dum de dum de dum de dum. Hmm. I remember the kid explaining how he hit upon this five beat form. You see the dramatic sentence or the heroic line must have harmony. Now for harmony we must have a sense of symmetry. Therefore, we must have an odd number of beats. Well, rather than an even number which would introduce duality, thereby splitting the heroic line. Well, three beats would be too brief a sentence, seven beats too cumbersome, losing all train of thought. Five was the optimum. But there was much more than this to Tamburlaine. There, there was a, a power, a guts, even a certain cruelty. The, the pig's bladders bursting with blood all over the stage, kings dethroned and cast into squalid prisons. Well, some branded it lewd and crude, and the master of the revels was known to dislike its whiff of the old faith. Still, he confused anything which wasn't achingly Protestant with the old faith. Tambling was a count of a different faith, from a time when men knew there was such a thing. But I certainly didn't see any heresy in it. No, it's a pity we lived, and still live, in an age where accusations of heresy can be made so readily. Yeah. I sometimes think that all faiths are more than anything a means to control men, to keep them in fear. I mean, if you brand your sworn enemy a heretic, you can justify any degree of barbarism. The trouble was, the public conflated the writer with the character. See, to them, Kit was Christopher Tamburlaine the Heathen. And he knew full well that his very notoriety swelled the audience number. There was a magic to Tamburlaine, a, an audacity, an intensity. The audience gasped and grinned even as they squirmed. Kit's lines conjured all the powers of heaven and earth and made them speak to every man. His next work was seen to be even more godless. Dr. Faustus, the sorcerer, who played the black arts to, to conjure Satan and all his armies from the gates of hell to satiate the earthly pleasures of the flesh. <laughs> At the time, I lacked Kit's focus. See, I had too many notions which were ill-disciplined and incomplete. I'd made some vague notes for a play about the sixth Henry. The first night we met, Kit offered to take a look at them, and uh, we soon repaired back to my rooms. Although he had, um, shall we say, another agenda. Well, I know it's difficult to believe, but I was also young and fresh-faced in those days. <laughs> but it was far more than that. There was a meeting of minds. I mean, never before or since have I known anyone whose philosophy was so closely matched to my own. We both endeavoured, in our, our different ways, to strip away the distorting and tinted lenses which filter our perception. The lenses of convention, of ritual, of, 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 of dogma, of precedent, of 
class, nationality and race, and even of language itself. Language, more than anything, can compromise our understanding. See, a limited vocabulary can only serve to reduce the world, to, to lump things together which belong apart, or, or to divide things which are really indivisible. Why do you think I felt the need to invent so many new words or to find new uses for old ones? But our very desire to name and categorise can itself be reductive. After all, a rose by any other name would smell just as sweet. But every time we open our mouths, our our words are but a compromise, a crude oversimplification of the true complexity of our thoughts. But if we can approach things indirectly through the metaphor and allegory in works of poetry and poetic prose, then we have a means of illuminating the truth of the world, of exposing its entire majesty. We weren't the only ones to explore these realms of philosophy, to think the unthinkable. Kit wanted to introduce me to some like-minded friends. Well, at first he didn't name names, but he told me the gatherings were known as the School of Night. The first meeting I attended took place at the home of Sir Walter Raleigh, no less. I mean, Raleigh himself presided at the head of a table laden with fine goblets and strewn with charts and scrolls. There were terrestrial and celestial globes, a magnificent brass astrolabe and various mysterious philosophical instruments. Also present that night, was Kit's noble patron, the handsome Sir Thomas Walsingham, cousin to Her Majesty's Secretary of State, Sir Francis Walsingham. At the time, he was still the most powerful man in the land, but he was known to be ailing. There was a certain rumour about court that Lord Burley's son, the hunchbacked Sir Robert Cecil, would soon step into Walsingham's shoes. Cecil was hardly ever seen in public, a secretive behind-the-scenes man, but already he pulled many strings. Raleigh was suspicious of me at first, you see. He preferred to be consulted before newcomers were introduced into the society, especially as I hadn't been told of their good service to the crown. See, that evening I discovered that Raleigh, Thomas Walsingham and Kit had all been dispatched on various foreign escapades for Her Majesty's Secret Service in the name of Sir Francis. They'd been sent to spy on English Catholics who'd recently fled to the continent and learned of fledgling plots by the French and the Spaniards. It was a dangerous game for a few gold sovereigns, and once assigned to the service, you could never be free of it. So, if Sir Francis died, then Cecil would become Kit's employer. And while Sir Francis employed the Black Arts through necessity, Cecil would do so with pleasure. The School of Knights' particular guest of honour that evening was Giordano Bruno. Metaphysician, natural philosopher and heretic. So he had been smuggled into London amidst great secrecy. It was Signor Bruno's intention to explain his doctrine of pantheism. The doctrine that 
God is not a separate entity ruling the universe from his throne in heaven, rather than that God is what he called the conscious universe. I mean, after all, consciousness is the highest form of complexity and what could be more complex than the entire universe, an intricate and infinitely connected system in which each part has some influence on every other part. Morality, for Bruno, was no more than a man-made quality. Well, the universe being indifferent to our lives, to our to our hopes, our fears, our joys, our sorrows. We are no more than mere cogs in a vast, unfeeling machine, or ants in the dust. Moreover, for Bruno, Christ was no more than the moral philosopher very much akin to the Stoic school. Well, a few short years after our meeting, it came as no surprise when I discovered that Senor Bruno had been hung upside down naked in a square in Rome and then burned by the stake. But Senor Bruno's presentation wasn't the only excitement that evening. Before he had a chance to finish, two constables arrived at the door and a official bearing the royal seal. I, I recall darting about like a headless chicken. And why were they here? What did they want? Would they arrest us all? Raleigh counselled calm and Senior Bruno was taken to the bedchamber and hidden in a priest hall behind a major tapestry. The rest of us gave the appearance of a merry evening too careless with the wine. <laughs> Although Kit didn't need any play acting for that. It turned out there was to be no search. They merely brought a summons for Thomas Walsingham to turn to court, because his cousin, Sir Francis, had died that very evening. It was the end of an era, and his passing was very shortly to spell great danger for Kit. Kit was a surprising choice for an agent of the service. I mean, not exactly guarded in his manner. I mean to say he blabbered, especially in the taverns, which was much of the time. He liked to shock, to provoke, both in his utterings and in his plays. See, at the time, many Puritan preachers were declaiming the theatre in general, and Marlowe's works in particular. They said that wherever he encouraged a questioning of the true faith, he gave succour to the government's enemies of the old faith. They implied that with Kit's words, he was twisting the knife into a majesty's heart little by little. I mean, these were dangerous times for England and had been since the day Her Majesty was excommunicated by Rome. I mean, there's no doubt that to Cecil, Kit was a loose cannon. He was a, a lone wolf, when there were many other lone wolves who together could form a pack. So, Cecil began to draw in his net by fractions of degrees, and the cogs of the service were duly turned against Kit. I mean, Kit knew he was under scrutiny. A man called Baines was often seen eavesdropping at the Unicorn. See, he and Kit shared a nodding acquaintance at Cambridge. Little man with a 
little wit and a smaller imagination. Kit thought him of no consequence, but I counselled caution. And yet another dangerous man, Kit's former spy master, Robin Poley, had also been seen hanging around Kit's rooms and the Bishopgate taverns. It worried me, and I advised Kit to draw back into the shadows a little. We were working together on our History of the Sixth Henry at the time. I wasn't even sure I wanted my name on the playbill. It was enough for me just to see it performed. I had no desire to be the centre of attention or of scrutiny. But Kit demanded it. He wanted to shake the dull drudges and the complacent clerics from their lethargy, from their self-conceit, their appointed wisdom. Shaken bodily. They must be made to see an alternative point of view contrary to their own, even if it was an ugly, blood-stained truth. You see, Kit thought he was untouchable because of his connection with Raleigh. He thought they'd merely watch him, wag their fingers, but fall shy of anything more. Cecil's minions, Poley and Baines, were plotting against Kit. And there was a third man, Topcliffe the Torturer. Between them, they were building up a dossier of Kit's utterances. Some from his plays, but many overheard in the taverns. That Christ was a bastard and his mother dishonest. That if there be any good religion, then it's the papists, because their service of God is done with more theatre and pretty ceremony. That all Protestants are hypocritical asses. And that all those who love not tobacco and boys are fools. did like that one. <laughs> no, it's a wonder they didn't act against Kit sooner. But no doubt Cecil didn't want to create a bleeding martyr. See, he had to find a way which was recognisable to other subversive elements as a warning. But also would be convincing and plausible to the people. So gradually, they garnered their evidence against him. Now Cecil had an adopted brother, Henry Ryersley, the third Earl of Southampton, known to many as Harry, the Earl of the Playhouses, although he didn't care for the epithet. Now Harry was a close friend of Thomas Walsingham, you know, Kit's noble patron, and more besides. So I didn't know this at the time, but it seems that through Harry, Cecil made the acquaintance of Thomas and found that he had a hold over Thomas. After all, it wouldn't bode well if his intimacy with Kit were to become banded about the court. If vague rumours and gossip can so often turn into more tangible threats. So, Thomas was forced to supply information to Cecil on Kit's state of mind. And particularly and to where his writings were leading. At the time, Kit was writing his history of the second Edward, his loss of the crown, his um, unnatural acts, and the grotesque manner of his dispatch. To Cecil, this will be a 
flagrant display of his removal by violence and murder of God's anointed on earth. So, Thomas became Cecil's eyes on Kit, and in turn, Harry was to play a similar role when I became the focus of Cecil's scrutiny. I wasn't aware until many years later that it was Cecil who charged Harry to take me under his wing. <laughs> he knew that I would find his charms and his purse quite irresistible. But in any event, a poet could do nothing without a patron. Well, to be a playwright is the food on the table. But poetry, that is the food of the gods. And remember, there was another reason we sought to entwine ourselves with a noble patron. It procured for the poet a degree of protection. Although in Kit's case, Walsingham's patronage would have quite the opposite effect. I first encountered Harry at the Unicorn. Thomas Walsingham introduced us and the noble Earl inquired after my humble scribblings. Well, I told him my intention to cover afresh the whole saga of the Wars of the Roses. But Harry was more interested in my poetry, which had always been my greater ambition. So, I recited to him my first attempt at a poem, the tragic tale of Venus and Adonis. But hers through which the crystal tears gave light, shone like the moon on water seen by night. It was as yet half-formed and crude, but well, Harry seemed impressed. I offered to dedicate to him a more polished version, and he in turn suggested that his connections could be of use to me. Kit was envious. He complained that he had several plays to his name, but as yet hadn't managed to secure such noble patronage. Well, this was meant as a jibe against Thomas, but our talk was interrupted by Ned Allen rushing into the tavern. There'd been a raid. The militia had ransacked Kit's lodgings, taken his papers and his books. What was worse, his fellow lodger, Thomas Kidd, had been taken to the Bridewell and hauled before Topcliffe for questioning. He'd been accused of heresy, aiding and abetting. Oh, Thomas Kidd was known to be a pious fellow, which would no doubt strengthen their case. And if he refused to blacken Kit's name, whatever persuasion his Lady of the Rack was lacking, his thumbscrews possessed in abundance. Of course, it was Kit they were really after. A notice pinned to the door of his chambers demanded his immediate attention at the Star Chamber. The court of inquiry for nobles and celebrities. I knew something like this would happen. Thomas Kidd was to be laid out on Topcliffe's rack, all because of his association with Kit. Perhaps we were all to be dragged down with him. Kit thought it wouldn't come to this, a stern lecture before the Star Chamber, and that's all. He'd been a naughty child who must now bow low and repent before his masters. They wanted to see him writhe and squirm. Kit had a mind to give them quite another 
sort of spectacle. Oh, Tom Kidd did indeed receive Topcliffe's ministrations with the rack and the thumbscrews. He was forced to sign a confession to the effect that Kit would regularly blaspheme and jest at the divine scriptures, jibe at prayers, contradict what had been written by the prophets, and assert that anything thought to be done by divine power might just as well have been done by man, and more besides. Despite his testimony, uh, Tom Kidd paid a price. He would write no more. No more thumbs, so no more plays. For Kit, the Star Chamber seemed the apt place to give a star performance. No one stood in his defence. Neither Raleigh nor Walsingham nor any of the other esteemed members of the School of Night. He had the stage entirely to himself. He was released on bail on charges of blasphemy and treason. Release he thought because he'd had his protectors. I wasn't so sure that the shelter of Raleigh's cloak offered any kind of protection. After all, Walsingham's patronage didn't keep him from arrest. First a whiff of scandal attaching itself to his noble arse, and he disappeared back to his country seat. So, not only was Kit a free man, but he also received a summons to meet with his former spy master, Robin Poley, at Deptford. Kit thought that if he was to work as an agent again, it was clear he'd been forgiven. But it seemed strange to me. I mean, one moment they're hauling him before the Star Chamber, the next they're welcoming him back into the fold. Why would they send someone they branded the Papists' ally to spy for their Protestants' cause? There was no reason that to suppose that Cecil looked upon Kit at all favourably. I mean, he was certainly behind Tom Kit's torture and Kit's arrest. And with Poley, nothing was ever quite as it seemed. Kit was supposed to meet with Poley at Widow Bull's rooming house on the Deptford Strand. I offered to accompany him to Deptford. Kit was unwilling at first, but we agreed that I would wait nearby. See, I knew a tavern on the Strand, and Kit was messaging me when the meeting was over. So, on the 13th day of May, 1593, Kit meets with Poley in Deptford, fully expecting to be dispatched to France or the Low Countries. Well, he was indeed to be dispatched. One last dispatch upon God's green earth. I don't know what really transpired inside that rooming house, or even if there were others present. But I'm sure Poli was the one to do the deed. The full might of Her Majesty's crown and all her exalted intelligences had no better target 
and the son of a Canterbury cobbler who merely wrote of the world. The hours rolled by and I'd received no message from Kit. So I left the tavern and made my way to the rooming house. There was no answer to my knock, but the door was ajar, so I entered with some trepidation. I called, but received no reply. The house appeared empty. Then, in the back room, I, I found Kit lying beside the hearth in a pool of blood. I took him in my arms, but he was cold. There was no breath of life. His final act was ended. His final stage, a bare room and a cold floor. His final prop, his own blooded knife. The tragic hero lay alone. I was inconsolable but it wouldn't do to be found at the scene of the crime so I had enough presence of mind to make a swift exit and I went back to my lodgings to grieve alone. I made a vow that day. One way or another I would get my revenge on Robert Cecil. As long as we both lived I swore I would be a thorn in his side. Of course, Kit wasn't the only playwright who suffered at the hands of the authorities. Well, you now know about Thomas Kidd. There was also Decker, Turner, Ben Johnson and others. They all served time for their art at Her Majesty's pleasure. Of course, I was more cautious than Kit and the others. Oh, but the criticism and ridicule are still there, if you look deep enough. Only more closely veiled. I mean, think of it, my, my kings are seldom paragons of virtue. They're weak, corrupt, blind, decadent, or murderously ambitious. I mean, think of my, my two Richards, of, of Lear, Julius Caesar. Think of Titus Andronicus, Coriolanus, and Macbeth. More often than not, in my plays, the attainment of royal power was more of a curse than a blessing. In like Kit's Edward II, I portrayed a fallen crown and a usurper taking control of the kingdom. I mean, there was more of a shade of Kit's Mortimer in my own Henry Bolingbroke. I know these depictions outraged Robert Cecil. You see, Kit was murdered as a subtle warning to the Playhouse fraternity. And I responded with equal subtlety. Sometimes I would get in a dig at Cecil directly. <laughs> Why do you think I made my murderous third Richard a hunchback like Robert Cecil? And my advice in Hamlet from the foolish and pompous Polonius to his son 
were almost a direct quotation from Lord Burley to his own son, Robert Cecil. You may recall that his words were published. Pompous affectation in itself. And then there was my most direct reference to Kit's murder in As You Like It, when Phoebe spoke of a great reckoning in a little room. You see, the coroner's official verdict had Kit murdered in a tavern brawl, supposedly arguing over the reckoning. What hokum. And then, just in case Cecil was in any doubt that I was referring to Kit, I littered the play with Ganymedes and Shepherds. You see, to me, Kit was always the shepherd of the playwrights, the one who led us all. You remember his lyric, the passionate shepherd to his love. And years later, I paid homage to the shepherd in The Merry Wives. To shallow rivers, to whose falls, harmonious birds sing madrigals. I'm often asked why I suddenly retired from my life as a playwright at the tender age of 47. Well, the answer's simple enough. When Cecil died three years ago, my motivation to be a constant source of irritation died with him. You see, two things motivate men above all else. The desire for immortality and the desire for revenge. Well, in my work, I satiated both desires. But the second was far stronger. So, when I learned of Cecil's death, it seemed like the apt time for this old man to put down his quill. And within weeks... I returned here to Stratford. Perhaps I've said enough. I eventually became estranged from Harry, the Earl of the Playhouses. Of course, I didn't know back then that he only became my patron because ordered to do so by Cecil. It wasn't until many years after Kit's murder that I discovered, through Baines of all people, that Harry was put up to the job by Cecil precisely to keep an eye on me and to garner evidence against Kit. And more importantly, that he knew in advance of Cecil's intention to have Kit struck down. When I learned of this, it was a huge blow to me. Then I vowed to put distance between us. We haven't spoken in more than two decades. Persistent clamour of uncomfortable truths. Kit taught me that lesson well. There are those who ask why I seemed reluctant to take credit for my plays. Well, Cecil clearly knew how I felt and there was much to be gained in stepping back from the limelight. You see, if I, like Kit, ever had to stand up in the Star Chamber, I could always emphasise my role as an actor-manager and downplay my role as a playwright. I mean, after all, amongst the company, there was an element of collaboration with many of the plays. 
I mean, Cecil could hardly confine a whole theatre company to the tower, as much as he'd have liked to. And all of the plays, with the exception of The Tempest, were based on preceding works to a greater or lesser degree. So, would my forerunners, named and nameless, also shoulder some of the blame? By keeping my name off the playbill, it was a means of avoiding responsibility and recriminations, should the need arise. Well, my final tale is told. And perhaps you're asking yourself if my relationship with Kit was ever more than just friendship. Although there should be no just about it. The loyal friendship is the noblest of human bonds. Let me answer it this way. After his murder, I dedicated an epic poem to Kit. The Rape of Ganymede. But it remains unpublished to this day. See, in this work, I lay Kit and myself too bare for any public scrutiny. The world doesn't need to know the details of our special bond. Nor, indeed, that we knew each other at all. You know it all now. But for most, truth will remain forever shrouded in the mist of time. Dead shepherd, now I find thy words of might. Whoever loved, that loved not at first sight. Mm -hmm.